with getting our, our stuff ready for Christmas. Um, that's uh, Joel Paris, our sound and media guy. So I want to thank Joel for all that he does up there. What a guy. Joel, you're awesome. All right. We are in Luke chapter 1 today. Now, we oftentimes read about Mary in the, in the stable, but today we're going to look at Zechariah and Elizabeth and the coming of John the Baptist. So join with me here as we get into the Word of God. Luke 1, 5 through 25, and then 57 through 64. Um, this is the miracle of the birth of John the Baptist and a powerful piece of scripture for us today, um, one that doesn't always get read uh, this time of year, and I think it should be. So let's uh, look together at God's word. I would encourage you to be in your pew Bible. We also have it for you up here on the board. It says this, in the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of um, Abijah. His, his wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well along in years. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and to burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years. The angel answered, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Now over to verse 57. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy and they shared her joy. On the eighth day they came to circumcise the child and they were going to name him after his father Zechariah, but his mother spoke up and said, No! He is to be called John. And they said to her, There is no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, His name is John. Immediately, his mouth was opened and his tongue was loose, 
and they began to speak praising God. The miraculous power of God. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Let's pray together. Father, as we come, help us to see what you have for us this morning. There are so many miracles around our Savior. Help us, Lord, not to miss it. And God, we do pray for experience of the miraculous and the supernatural. Lord, help us to learn from the account of Zachariah and Elizabeth and this baby boy all that you have for us in this time of Advent as we prepare our hearts for the coming of the Savior. We ask, Holy Spirit, have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. Names in today's culture are very different from what they were in the time of Christ. Um, in that time, your name carried a lot of importance. It talked about uh, your purpose, maybe who God was in your life, what the meaning was of your, of, of, of your, of your life, um, and really your name was very, the meaning of your name was very, very, very important in this time. So my name, Zachary, um, is the Hebrew for remembered by God, or the Lord remembers. So um, my wife, uh, Beth Elizabeth, is the Lord is absolutely reliable. Those are good names, right? Kayla is pure. Uh, Ethan means strong and optimistic. That's my son. Also solid and enduring. In Scripture, he was the standard of wisdom to which Solomon was compared favorably, 1 Kings 4.31. And you have our youngest daughter, Haley, which means hay meadow. We're like, huh? Um, we actually believe that there, there's a prophecy that's been, that's been given that declares a billion soul harvest for God from non-believers. So we actually um, see her as, as, as a bit of a, of a harvester in terms of bringing those to the Lord that are in need. So that's where her name comes in. Um, but I think a lot of times how we pick names, especially in our culture, is, you know, they sound pretty, they sound masculine, they seem nice, um, it fits, it rhymes with the last name, which is always helpful, you know. Um, but, but, I mean, so, in, you know, in our current culture, we've kind of gotten away from the meaning of names, although not always. Um, but in this culture, the one that we're talking about to which Jesus and John are born, a name carried your identity. It said something about who you were or what God was or what you were expected to become in the culture. And we come to a man named Zachariah whose name means the Lord will remember. The Lord will remember. You can... Turn with me in your mind back to that day. Here's Zechariah. He served for a long time as a priest. Remember back then, everybody had to go to the, the worship place, the temple. Remember, this is before Jesus, so there weren't any Christian churches. There was just a Jewish synagogue. And everyone, I mean, not one family couldn't show up. Everyone had to come and give sacrifice before the priests. And there were many priests that filled the, the synagogue. So he was one of many, many, many priests and we see Zechariah, he comes in. And it's one of the biggest days of the year of the church. The year where one priest, once a year, gets to go and bring the incest into the holiest of holies. So, so just so you know, the temple was set up like this. There was a main temple. There was the outer, outer gates. Where people would, would cry and, 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 um, and pray. There was the inner gate, which was open to everybody to come in. And then there was a, a room after that that was open to just those that were in really good standing in the synagogue, as well as to the priests. And then off of that room, there was a, a fourth level or fourth layer that was, um, it was the holiest of holies, and there was a curtain between that third room and the holiest of holies. Remember when Christ dies, the, the curtain tears in two? Like Beth talked about, so we don't need a priest anymore. But back then, there was, that, there was that curtain, and only one priest could enter into that room once a year to give the offering. 
many priests would serve 20, 30, 40 years and never get the opportunity to go into the holiest of holies. So here's Zechariah. They would draw a lot. That was how they discerned back. Remember, they didn't have the Holy Spirit yet, so they, they didn't ask the Holy Spirit. They just, they just would draw lots and pray that God would give the right to the right person. And so here's Zechariah. This is kind of the biggest day of his life in terms of his, of his ministry career. And he's getting ready, and he's getting all his fanciest robes on. And I mean, they're putting all the really high, high-end stuff on him. And you can just kind of see him smiling. You know, here's my, here's my one big day. And, and people, it says the people in that, in that culture would actually call a priest rich if he had the opportunity to go into the holiest of holies. And so here he is, and you can see him preparing himself, thinking back upon his life as he's at the end of his ministry career, going to go, he's, and he's going to go in and, and give the, the incense. And we see his name is very important. It means God will remember. Now why is that significant? At the point that Zechariah is ministering, people have not heard from a prophet or a word from God in more than 400 years. Is that a long time? 400 years since anyone had heard a word from God. And here is Zechariah, whose name is God Will Remember. God will not forget his promises. It's been 400 years, and here is Zechariah. You know, he, he and his wife Elizabeth, they were both a line of Aaron. They were considered doubly blessed because they both came from the priestly line of Aaron. They were supposed to be uh, role models and, the, and the, you know, the, the elite of God. And yet because they were barren, they'd had no children, they were actually considered in the culture as being cursed. Remember, having children back then was not just a luxury you had to pay for. It was actually a goal for every person was to have offspring to carry on the family name and keep the bloodline alive. And so here they'd been barren, and so people actually thought of them as, as, as cursed or less than or wondered if there had been sin in their lives. And so Zechariah had hope and and believe that they were going to have a child, a son, but it never had happened. And so here he comes in. He comes into the holiest of holies. Remember, in in the Old Testament times, people, when they had gone into the holiest of holies, if they came with anything wrong or did anything wrong, actually, people had been killed. Going into the holiest of holies was also dangerous. Power of God is awesomely powerful. And so here's Zechariah. You can see him. He gets all of his stuff on. You know, he's got his robes. He has the incense things. And he quietly, prayerfully slips in. And he puts the incense on the altar. And he's praying. He's lifting to God in prayer. The prayers of the people in his own heart. Here he is in the, in the realm. And all of a sudden, as he's praying, he opens his eyes and he realizes that he's not alone. You ever had a moment like that? And you're in a room, maybe by yourself, and all of a sudden you realize there's somebody else in there? And you're like, whoa. Now if it's someone that you love, that's not a big deal. It's a nice surprise. But here is Zachariah on the biggest day of his life, doing that thing that all priests only dream of doing, and all of a sudden, there's somebody else in the room. Remember, no one's allowed to come in the room. So as as he tries to wrap his mind around what the heck is going on and why is there somebody else in there, he hears a voice. And we're told the angel's name is Gabriel. His name means Mighty One of God. Is that not a cool name? The Mighty One of God sits there and says, Hello, Zechariah. And his first words are, Do not be afraid. You've got to figure he's a pretty imposing figure. Never seen an angel, but I'm guessing they're pretty awesome and pretty imposing and pretty powerful. 
And the first thing he says is, do not be afraid. Do you guys know that the timeline here, the last time that we had seen the angel Gabriel was more than 600 years before this date? The book of Daniel. Gabriel comes to Daniel and says, the Messiah will come. In a number of years, the Messiah is going to come. He says, um, this is the 77s are declared for your people, Daniel. First seven sevens and then 62 more sevens until the anointed one will be cut off. Those that did the math in Israel estimated that it was about 483 years, give or take. And so here is the mighty one of God, Gabriel, has gone to, to Daniel to, to, to talk about the coming of the Savior. He gives the message, and then he's gone for 600 years. More than 400 since the last prophet, Malachi, had spoken. So he's writing the timeline's good. And he says, fear not, Zechariah. He says what God has promised, God's going to do. Is there a prayer for something and, and, and you felt like you didn't get what you prayed for? Anybody ever done that? Some of you are, you've always got it when you prayed for it? I mean, I, I remember praying for things and being like, God, it's been two weeks. You know? We need this now. It's been two weeks, God. We're talking about 400 years. And you begin to see the people are beginning to not believe God anymore because it's been so darn long. Why all the silence? I mean, think about what we've done in our culture in 100 years. You know, man on the moon, iPods. 400 years they're waiting. And you see Zechariah's name. God will remember. God will always fulfill his promise. That is good for that time, and that's good for now. But God's promise is to take care of me. You bet he will. I haven't seen it yet. He's still going to do it. I mean, what God has promised in his word, we can know. I've never read, I've never seen God not meet a promise. It's not in his character. It's not who he is. It's not how he's made. He can't not make, keep the promise. It's just who he is. But yet we see a whole people, a whole church of people that have begun to believe a lie, which is that God isn't what he says. That God isn't who he promises. That God falls short. That God's not worth it. That God's not able. All the things we sang about today, they believed the lie that said he was none of those things. You follow me? The lie had been, had been sown that said, no, God just says stuff and doesn't do it. And through the man whose name means that God will always keep his promise, God sends his angel, and the angel says, you'll have a son. I'm going to keep my promise to you. And you can see Zechariah saying to him, which promise? The promise of the Messiah? The promise I'm going to have a kid? I haven't prayed about a kid in a long time. I'm an old man, he says. And Gabriel says both. Both are going to come. You're going to have a son who's going to prepare the way for the Lord. You guys are like, what does that mean? Where does that come from? It's a good question. I'm glad you asked. Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 through 6. Remember, Malachi is the last prophet that we hear from before the coming of, of Gabriel here. The last prophet we hear from for 400 years writes these words. He says, see, this is God through the prophet Malachi. See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before that great, great and dead, dreadful day of the Lord. That's when Christ comes. He will turn the heart of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers or else I will come and strike the land with the curse. In other words, God makes a promise, I'm going to send Elijah back to you so that you can know that my son is coming. And so he says, so, so the angel says, hey, Zechariah, your son is going to be that one that was prophesied about. He's going to set the way. 
Why does that matter? Because in the Old Testament, Elijah called down judgment. You remember, remember Elijah in the, in the Old Testament? Remember the, the, the prophets of Baal? They had the showdown. There's, there's awful King Ahab and Jezebel who were promoting Baal worship in the land. And he goes up, and there's a drought for three years, and he goes up on the mountain, and he challenges the prophets of Baal. They've killed the prophets of God. It's one prophet in Elijah against all the prophets of Baal, and he says the one who answers by fire is the winner, and they put the sacrifice on the altar, and the fire comes down from heaven and eats up all the sacrifice, and they kill the prophets of Baal. Remember that one? And Elijah goes through Israel calling down judgment. You have failed. You've come up short. You deserve punishment. That's the Old Testament model. And God, because of his heart of redemption and love, says, I'm going to send that same prophet back, but instead of calling out judgment and condemning people, he's going to bring the hearts of the fathers back to the sons and the sons back to the fathers. Children to parents and parents to children. He's going to bring reconciliation. He's going to bring healing. He's going to help people turn their eyes back to the way they're supposed to be. Holiness and righteousness away from sin. And Gabriel says... Zechariah, your son will be that man. What an amazing promise. <laughs> and understandably, Zechariah is like, uh, you know, I'm really old and my wife is too. And she couldn't even ever have kids when she was young. So I'm not sure about this. And, and you got to love, I mean, I don't, know, I don't know if you have to love, I love. I mean, look at how this guy introduces himself. Hi. I'm Gabriel, verse 19. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you to tell you this good news. That is the best line on a business card ever. I stand in the presence of God and have been sent to tell you this good news. That's his title in this picture. And so he can't speak until what was prophesied by the angel comes to pass. And Elizabeth, her name is the Lord is an oath, or the Lord is absolutely reliable, consecrated to God. Isn't that a great name? The Lord is absolutely reliable. So, so God always remembers his promises, and the Lord is absolutely reliable is the couple, right? Right? That's a, good, that's a good foundation. The Lord always keeps his promises, and the Lord is absolutely reliable. And here they are, they're coming in, and Elizabeth has wanted a child her whole life. And you can see where they've given up praying for God to move, and, and yet, here we see God proves himself faithful even when it looks impossible. I mean, even when it looks impossible, I mean, I, I can't stress enough. How many of you have prayed for something and it doesn't happen? You say, you know what? It's impossible that it's ever going to happen again. You ever do that? So we stop hoping? It's impossible. Ah, I'm, 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 I'm never going to have it. And then what do we do? We put it away. Or we get bitter. One of the two things. In God's message in the person of Christ, in the baptism of John, wherever it is, his message is always the same. It's never impossible with me. Nothing's impossible for me. It might take longer than you think, not because I'm mean, but because I've got a plan. And then, and then we have John. And John's name is... God is gracious. Isn't that good? So the forebear for the Savior is God is gracious. In grace, He comes. He comes in grace, saying that in love, I prepare for you. I let you know what's coming. The Savior is coming. And through this one of grace, I'm calling you back to be a people of myself. That's 
what God declares. God is gracious. Gabriel says he'll turn the hearts of people back to God. And you know, it's funny because John's like, like the last prophet of the Old Covenant before Jesus, but he really is a New Covenant prophet. He's sharing the truth of God's power and love of goodness. They do not recognize the grace of God found in repentance. He's calling people to repent, not because they're going to get punished, but because he wants them to be ready to receive the Savior. Okay, it's like this. The greatest thing ever is coming. You've got to be ready. Okay? Um, if I want to go do a, a uh, what's those things called, a triathlon? You ever seen those things? Right? Have you seen those things? Those things are crazy. You're doing like swimming and running and... Biking. I wasn't going to guess that. That's good. Swimming and, and hiking, swimming and running and biking. Okay? Now, if that's going to happen, I've got to prepare myself for that. You understand? The greatest thing ever is coming. He's saying, you've got to get ready. We've got to repent and turn our hearts back to God. We need to stop living in disobedience because it's not the best that God has for us. And we have to understand, God doesn't tell us to not do stuff because we're going to get on the bad list. He tells us because our life has consequences. And he wants to see us live in the fullness of his plan and his love and not settle for something shorter than that. I thought there's some people when I was growing up who were like, oh man, I, I, you know, I'm only young once. I've got, to, you know, I've got to do drugs and have premarital sex and do all this stuff the Bible says is wrong because, man, that's what being alive is all about. That's a lie. God says, I've got a great plan for you and that if you can live in it, the reward is going to be a life full of me and happiness and fulfillment and satisfaction. I have counseled so many people who have come in and said, I've got to tell you, Pastor, I've got this horrible situation, and it comes out of not living in obedience with the Word. And so I'm reminded every day that if we get out of line with God's Word, there are consequences that suck. And John comes to call us back to living right. Choosing right. To saying, God, I want the fullness of your plan for my life so that I can have that life of abundance. Because when we're in line with what God's plan is, our life is amazing. And John comes that we can find that truth before Jesus shows up. So that when he shows up and he begins to release who he is, those that, that, have, that have turned away from wrong and committed to right can receive what he has. As we conclude, I, I want to remind you that we serve a God who remembers a God who is faithful, a God who is abundant. You guys, these things, it can be so easy to lose track of them, yet I believe that we're given opportunities every day to, for God to prove these things true in our lives if we, allow, if we allow for it. We serve a God who loves fiercely, a God who is mighty, a God who is faithful and gracious, a God for whom nothing is too big to be forgiven. A God who I believe with all my heart wants you to find victory in any situation where it feels like you're going to be defeated. Because the more that we find His victory, the more that we see that He's real. And I think a lot of us are, are, are in places right now where we're like, oh man... There's, there's a situation or a circumstance or a thing, and, and if only this thing would shift, we would be able to see that God's real and God's powerful. And I want to pray today that we find that to be real in our lives. Let's pray together. Lord, this, this passage of Scripture 
reveals for us a great miracle in the person of John, how he came to be born, how he came to be that one that fulfilled the role of Elijah, that our hearts could receive the Savior when he came. Lord, may we be a people of reconciliation in place of wounding. Lord God, may we be a people who see that the right way to live is your way, is revealed by your word, that it's actually more fun and more fulfilling the lies of the enemy that say break that, that, that guideline that you've given us. And Lord, we pray that your spirit would, would move in power in our lives. I pray that each of us would have an experience, Lord, of you that matches the supernatural power that you displayed in the birth of John, in the birth of Jesus, and his protection, and his provision. Lord, give us a supernatural understanding of who you are, of how you love, of, of what you are able to do, Lord. May the miracles not just stay in Scripture, but may they be what we experience as we, by faith, step out and say, yes, I want you offer to me. Lord God, may we always trust you to fulfill your prophecies, to fulfill your promises, to fulfill your word. And God, we ask that this day you would be our portion that our hearts would be captivated by your love and your goodness. We worship you, Lord, and we praise you. May your word speak your truth to our lives. Might we exchange the lies of the world or the lies of the enemy for your truth and your goodness. And might we even see the good in the world as we celebrate this Christmas and this Advent together. We pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Help us spread the message. Click on the donate button below or go to shermanoakspc.org forward slash donate. Thank you.